In this video, you'll learn how nullable types are implemented at the bytecode level. Also, we'll look at nullability and generics, and you'll learn the difference between a list of nullable values and a nullable list. Under the hood, nullable types are implemented using annotations. The Kotlin compiler simply adds nullable and not null annotations to the corresponding type usages, which gives us no performance overhead when using nullable types. There is another solution to the same nullability problem, which is called optional or option types. They are special library classes that store a value or absence of the value. And you can check whether the value is available or not. That solves the same problem as nullable types, because optionals allow you to say explicitly whether the variable can have no value option similar to null or not. Despite nullable types and optionals solve the same problem, they are very different in terms of the performance. Optional type is a wrapper that stores the reference to the initial object. For each optional value, an extra object is created. At the same time, nullable types don't create any wrappers. They are implemented via annotations. To make sure you understand it, answer this question. How many objects are created to store the value of a nullable string? The answer options are either two objects or only one. Only one object is created to store a string value. There is no additional wrapper as with optionals. When you use nullable types under the hood, the Kotlin compiler adds additional annotations which are only checked at the compilation time. At runtime, nullable string is the same string as regular Java string. Both types String and nullable string correspond to Java lang string type in Java, but with different annotations. At runtime, it's one string, there is no wrapper. All the checks going on at the compilation time with the help of annotations. That's the end of the first story. Now another story not about annotations, but about nullability and generics. In this picture, you can see the difference between a list of nullable elements and a nullable list. When you use a list of ints, you can put the question mark after int or after list itself or in both places. The first one means that every element might be either null or not null. And the second one means that the whole list might be either null or not null. To better understand that, mark the lines that need a question mark to make the code compile. Of course, you can add a question mark to each line. To make every access safe and make every int nullable int, but that's not the question. The question is, which are the minimum amount of question marks to make this compile? Add only the question marks that are really needed. Let's do the cases one by one. The first list is the list of nullable values. We can dereference it without a problem because it's a not null reference. But when we try to assign the first element into a variable, we see an error. The inferred type is nullable int, but int was expected. The content of the list is nullable ints, and the type of the first element is nullable int. That means that we need to add a question mark to the type of the i variable. That's all for the first list. For the second case, it's a little bit more complicated. We have a nullable list, and that means that both accesses won't compile. We need here safe access. We can add a couple of question marks to fix that. And now here is a tricky place, because we've added a question mark that makes line 6 uncompiled. We have the type mismatch, inferred type is nullable int, but regular int was expected. That makes us add another question mark to line 5. So the answer is lines 2, 3, 5 and 6. In this video you've learned that nullable types are implemented using annotations, that brings no performance overhead. Also, now you can confidently use question mark to mark either the uh, list element type as nullable or the list itself. Next, we are going to look at the new operator that makes type costs safe in Kotlin.